Okay, so it's time for coordination mix two. It's the last mix we started talking about the formation of the nervous system, and we talked about the reflex arc. So we're going to review just a little bit of that again, and then we're going to spend the rest of the PPT talking about how impulses are actually sent on nerve cells. It's, a, it's going to be a relatively complicated a set of instructions that we're going to go through, but, you know, just keep rewinding and watching again until you understand it, and then we'll look at it again in tomorrow's class. Today we're talking about sending an impulse down a neuron, and to do this we need to look at how the transmission of an action potential down a myelinated neuron after the initiation of a resting potential, so basically after a neuron gets stimulated, how does that stimulation travel through the axon? And we'll be talking about why myelin, myelin sheaths on myelinated neurons are so important for sending impulses quickly. And we'll talk about how um, the refractory period keeps things moving in the right direction. And how frequency is an important part of determining the uh, strength of an Now, if you remember from the last PBT, we talked about different types of neurons. The three types of neurons that exist in a system would be our sensory neuron, which are therefore taking in information uh, and sending it to the intermediate neurons. The intermediate neurons are the ones that are responsible for your brain and your spinal cord being able to um, make a decision, basically using the information and some type of set point, they decide whether or not an action is necessary. And then we have our motor neurons, and our motor neurons are when the response, or the output, sorry, is sent to the motor neurons so that they can cause a response by activating a gland or most of the time a muscle. So those are our types of neurons. And we also talked about the mighty reflex, and that a reflex action is where our intermediate neurons in our brain and our spinal cord are basically reacting very, very quickly to a stimuli, so some type of significant input much higher or lower than the set point it's supposed to be uh, as it travels through the spinal cord or section of the brain uh, it is immediately picked up by an integrator and the integrator sends out the output and so we very very quickly will pull our hand away from a hot object or we will quickly move our head away from something that is swinging out towards us even though we might not know what it is uh, and this uh, allows us to react faster than we would if we allowed our brain to process the information uh, a little bit more deeply and uh, those fractions of a second might actually save our lives and probably reduce damage to our body so that's really the benefit of having a reflex so the reflex arc is a sensory impulse is going to be sent to an intermediate in the spine compared to a set point and then another impulse will be sent to the effector neurons which will cause uh, some type of change and of course this is done so fast that Things like pain and texture, um, uh, temperature and texture can be felt before we even receive pain because pain is only received by the brain. So um, before you uh, you really realize that you're being injured, you'll, you can take in all this extra information about the environment and react to it. And then your brain catches up and says, oh wait, ow, ow, I'm in pain because I've been injured. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about how we send an impulse. Okay, so an impulse is actually um, basically caused, uh, is called an action potential. And an action potential is what is generated when there is a change in the potential difference between the inside and outside of a nerve cell. So if you look at our chart over here, we have the resting potential. And then this up here, this point of no return, is our action potential. So this whole structure here is our action potential. An action potential basically has to cross a threshold and once we've crossed a threshold we we will continue down and we will we'll send the impulse further down uh, the nerve cell. But when we talk about an action potential we're talking about the idea of some stimulus that's strong enough to cause depolarization. And depolarization is basically we have between the the inside and outside of a nerve cell anywhere from uh, negative, oops, negative uh, 20 to 10 to 20 uh, millivolts as a resting potential difference. Okay, but here we're uh, looking at uh, about 70 millivolts right here. 
we'll have some type of uh, millivolt difference between the inside and the outside of, of, a, of a nerve cell, and it's called our resting potential. And basically, at a, the resting potential is a stable state from the neuron, and the neuron uh, is not sending any impulses, but the neuron can receive stimuli either from a receptor cell or it could be uh, an uh, integrator getting information from a sensory neuron or it could be an effector cell getting information from an integrator neuron. But wherever it's slowly getting this information from, eventually it causes this change in the resting potential. And if it suddenly spikes and we go past this threshold, we have a huge change in the difference between the inside and outside of our, of our cell membrane. And that is our action potential, and that is what is called uh, depolarization. So basically what's happening is typically we have, let's get rid of this, we have charges in the negative millivolts, and we're going past zero all the way into the positive millivolts. So the membrane potential is basically going from negative on the inside and positive on the outside and switching and becoming positive on the inside and negative on the outside, and it's a very fast change. So, uh, because we have to hit this threshold potential, it's basically called the all or nothing law. And this is the idea that unless you get enough stimuli, uh, you won't get an action potential generated, so then information isn't sent. Um, this is kind of around the idea of um, Basically, you're going to ignore certain stimuli uh, once you get used to it, or if a stimuli isn't strong enough, there's no reason for your body to really react to it. It's, it's something that's not important. An example of this would be, like, uh, for example, the clothes on your body. When you put the clothes on your body in the morning, um, the moment you put the clothes on your body, you feel them. Your, your pressure sensor nerves all over your skin register that there is fabric touching you and you're sending this impulse to your brain and your brain can physically feel the, this clothing and is registering it and but over time after just a few seconds to a minute or two um, your brain starts to ignore the information that's coming from your uh, your sensory neurons and it'll, it'll adjust the action, it'll adjust the threshold, sorry, the threshold potential so it'll actually take this threshold and will raise it a little bit maybe more to like up here so then you're getting information and your cells are depolarizing and depolarizing and depolarizing over and over again but because they're not crossing this line here there's no information being sent to the brain so the brain isn't really registering this uh, change in because there is no um, there's no message being sent uh, there's no impulse being sent along these nerves and this is really great because this allows your, your body and your brain to regulate itself to basically decide uh, what information is a little bit more important than what information you're going to choose to ignore. Uh, you can do this in, in various ways. Uh, you can, for example, train yourself or, or uh, take some time where you're, you'll cover your eyes and uh, you'll take in less information from your eyes and you'll try taking in more information from your ears and you'll try to be very, very quiet and you'll try to focus uh, your ears to, to pay attention more to the sound around you and uh, you'll increase uh, your, You'll lower your threshold potential so that even the smallest amount of sound Causes an impulse so that your brain can hear it or if you go the other direction where you guys maybe are studying And it's very noisy outside the classroom and you'll try to focus really hard on what you're reading and uh, and, and the information that's coming from the book and slowly you will raise the threshold for your, your auditory sensors and you'll start to ignore the background information around you and you, you won't even realize how noisy it is or you won't hear somebody maybe when they're calling your name even because uh, you're focusing so much on the reading and, and, and suppressing the information coming from your, from your ears. So basically the, this all or nothing principle is a really big part of regulation inside of your brain. Okay, so then in about one millisecond, a cell's potential can raise all the way up to about 40 millivolts, and then it'll drop down to about negative 80 millivolts again. So we have our depolarization, which is where we become more positive. Our repolarization is where we go back down to being negative. And then we actually go much, much further below the resting potential, which is right here. <laughs> Sorry. So we go lower than this line. 
and that's called hyperpolarization. So we've gone lower than we need to, and then we'll adjust ourselves. We'll come back up to our resting potential, and then the nerve will sit there and will wait uh, to be stimulated again and to try to send another action potential. So this little period here, this period in red, this is actually called our refractory period. And uh, this is basically when the axon uh, is waiting to basically recharge and cannot be re-stimulated. So it can't keep, sing, uh, can't keep sending uh, more signals any more uh, faster than it already was. Uh, or it can't send an impulse basically until the membrane's uh, potential difference has been restored again. And this refractory period, uh, we'll talk about it in another slide soon, is uh, really important because it helps move information in one direction in your nervous system. You remember from yesterday, we talked about the idea that you always move information from the dendrite down towards the cell body and then towards the axon and then to the next, um, in, to the next um, cell, the nerve cell. Uh, but today you'll see when we talk about how an impulse is actually generated, you'll see that uh, impulse information could go in multiple directions along the axon. But because of the refractory period, um, the information is really only pushed in one direction. So that makes sure that information is always flowing in the right direction inside our nervous system. So there's less confusion. So this is the general idea of what an action potential is. This is what one would look like if you were to graph it. And uh, let's go through what is actually happening when we have depolarization and repolarization and hyperpolarization in this refractory period. Um, what's happening to the membrane? So let's talk about how an action potential is actually generated and what happens there. So first off, uh, basically an action potential is a change in the amount of sodium uh, and chloride, or sorry, sodium, not chloride, sodium and potassium on the inside and the outside of the cell. And first we have to basically set up a resting potential. Sorry, sorry, ignore that first part. So here's our, our resting potential here at negative 80, okay? And during this resting potential, we have positive charges outside. Actually, let me do this in red. Positive charges outside and negative charges. Oops. Change color. Negative charges inside, positive charges outside. And we have uh, sodium channels here. And we have potassium channels. And we have sodium potassium pumps. And when there's positive charges on the outside and negative charges on the inside, our sodium channels are closed, so there's no movement of sodium. And our potassium channels basically have an equal exchange where uh, for as many potassium entering, there is a potassium leaving. So we're basically maintaining this, this negative charge on the inside, positive charge on the outside. So then we have some type of stimulus. So here is our stimulus right here. And because of the stimulus, uh, some of the sodium channels are going to get uh, encouraged to be open from this stimulation, whatever this signal might be. And so as they start to open, sodium channels are going, sodium ions are going to start to flood in to our cell. So that means the Inside is going to be positive, sorry, the outside is going to be positive, but a little less positive because we're losing the positively, positively charged sodium ions. And the inside is still negative, but it's a little less negative because we are gaining positive sodium charges. And so you can see here in this chart, we are moving slightly more towards the positive um, threshold point. So the ion uh, change in the membrane potential eventually hits uh, higher than, than, uh, than whatever the threshold is. So it could be a, a positive 10 millivolts, 30 millivolts. Uh, let's say it gets up to 40 millivolts. So it gets up to 40 millivolts. Up here, we have a complete depolarization. And when this happens, basically the, uh, the sodium channels are going to close and we have a complete switch. So we've had enough sodium channels have, have opened uh, so that the outside is now negative and the inside is now positive. So we've had depolarization. So here we had positive 
and on the outside and uh, negative on the inside and to the process of depolarization epol we now have switched with positive on the inside and negative on the outside okay when depolarization happens we now have repolarization and that is this part right here this is our repolarization so we want to go back more towards uh, being negative on the inside so we stop letting in positive charges because the sodium channels have closed uh, the potassium channels are going to open and potassium is going to flood out down the concentration gradient, right so positive charges are now leaving the membrane and uh, in comparison to the outside to the inside we have a repolarization Okay, so the potassium leaves and the inside potential to the, the membrane drops and this is our once again returning to our resting potential so here again we've had a switch here it's now negative the sodium I'm sorry the outside is now comparatively positive and we are back down here at our minus 80 millivolts All right and when this happens our potassium channels will close or there will be an equal exchange of potassium between in and out so we have uh, basically we've returned back to our resting potential so, so again to repeat we start being positive with lots of sodium lots of sodium ions in the outside here so I'll do a sodium in red so here's lots of sodium on the outside lots of potassium on the inside we get stimulation which causes our sodium channels to open so sodium comes rushing in and that changes the inside from positive or from negative to positive and the outside from positive to negative that causes sodium or potassium channels to open and so potassium comes flying out again down concentration gradient and then ultimately we end up back where we started in terms of the difference not in neg uh, about negative millivolts however there is a difference from what we had before now all the sodium is on the inside of the membrane and all of the potassium is on the outside of the membrane and this is where we have our refractory period because if we had stimulation again uh, nothing would happen if we had stimulation again and our sodium channels opened we wouldn't have um, the positive and negative charges switch places we wouldn't have depolarization because the sodium would move out of the cell instead of into the cell because of the concentration difference so this is what our refractory period is actually made of is because we need our sodium potassium pump we need this guy here to move the sodium back out so we need to take the sodium here kick it out and we need to take the potassium that's on the outside and pull it back in so that we can recreate the sodium and potassium concentration difference that we had at the beginning uh, before we had stimulation so this is our resting potential uh, while we re basically we have we're at our resting potential but we have to reset the position of the sodium and potassium ions so during this period the the nerve cell cannot send another action potential and uh, this is called a refractory period so this is a brief pause before more uh, impulses can be set so i was just saying this the concentration gradient for sodium potassium uh, ions is really the whole reason why impulses can move as fast as they are that depolarization and that repolarization is because of concentration gradients sodium rushing in very quickly causes the fast depolarization potassium leaving very quickly causes the fast repolarization and so we have to set up the concentration gradient uh, again in order to do this process again so we're gonna have to use ATP and we're gonna pull out um, so we're gonna pull in two potassium for every three sodium and because that's three to two in terms of positive charges that's mostly why we have a potential difference so we have three positive charges for every oh sorry let's do different colors uh no we'll do this guy purple so there's our membrane oh there's our membrane so for every 
three sodium that leave, positive, 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 two potassium are coming in, positive, positive. So there we have a, a three to two ratio. So then let's say, you know, we just do this, you know, times by a hundred. We end up with a 300 to 200 ratio, right? So we're creating a potential difference. So the outside is, oh, sorry, the outside is very positive, and the inside comparatively is negative. Now they both have positively charged ions, but it's a comparison. It's a potential difference between them. The outside is more positive, and the inside is more negative, negative. and that's where we're getting our negative 70 millivolts or negative 80 millivolts uh, potential difference between the membrane. So this is all because of our one ATP is two potassium coming in and three sodium leaving. And this is where we create our potential difference and our concentration gradient, uh, which are important. So uh, we have to repolarize the membrane after an impulse is, or uh, uh, after the, the repolarization, uh, we have to basically re rebuild these concentration gradient different this this potential difference along with our concentration difference uh, in order to send another impulse again and this is where our refractory period is taking place. Okay, so maybe that was just like super confusing and you need a little bit more of an explanation. So let's go through this video. I've got a nice video. Watch it as many times as you need to, and I want you to sequence the steps of an action potential in your notes. But I also want you, in addition to listing the steps, I want you to both list the steps and I want you to make a graph showing how the potential difference between the inside and outside of the membrane is changing as we go through an action potential. So I want you to make both of these in your notes so you can see an action potential as it's drawn out like this on a graph and an action potential in terms of, of sodium coming in potassium going out, things like that. Okay, so you, know, you have to understand it in, in multiple ways. So then let's talk about, uh, now that we cause an action potential, how do we send an impulse? Like what does that mean when we're sending an impulse down an axon? So uh, an impulse basically has to start with an action potential. An impulse is a wave of information moving down an axon. An axon is just, or an action potential is one movement of the wave down the axon. So an impulse will be made of many action potentials along multiple parts of the axon. It's not one impulse is one action potential. An, an impulse must be many action potentials in different parts along the same axon of the cell. So basically, first we have to start off with a stimulus that has to be strong enough in order to cause an action potential. It has to pass our threshold. So here's another example where we're starting with negative 70 and we have to get up to positive 30 and maybe zero is our threshold. So here we're at resting potential here and we're getting more and more stimulation, more and more stimulation. Sodium channels open, sodium starts coming in, depolarizations faster and faster and eventually we cross our threshold and at the threshold sodium starts rushing in really 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 quickly and we go all the way up to positive 30 millivolts and we have depolarization. So we've completed our depolarization and we've hit our action potential. And remember, unless we pass the threshold, 
we it's not considered an action potential. We have to go have enough depolarization to complete the passing through the, the threshold. Then we have to do our repolarization here. So then we're going to allow potassium, sodium channels are going to shut, potassium is going to open, and potassium is going to leave. So potassium is flooding out faster and faster as we're moving down. And then we actually get down to our resting potential here. Oh, I want to do that in black. Our resting potential down here. But actually, because potassium channels can be a little slow to close, it's hard to see. These are Ks. Those are all Ks. Those are all potassium. Um, because the potassium channels can be a little slow sometimes, we have our hyperpolarization, where it takes a little longer for the potassium channels to close than necessary. And then we have returning to our resting potential, but then we have our refractory period in which we have to use the sodium potassium pump in order to put the sodium back out and bring the potassium back in, right? So once we hit that threshold, the sodium channels open and then and, uh, the sodium is going to rush down a concentration gradient. The inside of this cell is going to depolarize and so we'll go from negative millivolts to positive millivolts. Then the shift causes, <laughs> sorry, this shift will cause the sodium channels uh, more sodium channels to open, which causes even faster depolarization, and it signals like a wave which will move down the axon. And basically the strength of a signal, of an impulse, is done in its frequency. So the more frequent these action potentials are happening within a small amount of time, the stronger the signal is. So when you guys are basically putting your hand on something hot, uh, you get an impulse telling you that it is warm. And then you get more and more impulses in a quicker, shorter, uh, more and more of them in the same amount of time. You're increasing the frequency of these impulses, and that's telling your brain that it's even warmer than you imagined. And eventually gets to the point where it's such a high frequency of impulses that your body reacts and says, no, no, that's hot. That's dangerous. You're damaging yourself. So then you pull your hand away, and your brain says, you have to move your hand because... This, the frequency of these impulses is so is so quick that it's it's uh, it's telling us we have to do something. Okay, so then this moving like a wave down the axon. Uh, this is what it would look like. So here is a section of an axon. Okay, and uh, we've had an action potential here because now we have positive insides from sodium rushing in, and here is our negative outside, and we haven't had potassium leave yet, so we haven't had it switch back yet. But because of this positive charge, you remember that positive and negative charges, they, they kind of affect each other. So this positive charge here goes in this direction, and this positive charge goes in this direction, and uh, it influences the negative charges on this, uh, on the next part of the of the of the membrane, so then that encourages this to go through depolarization. So the stimulus um, caused this depolarization. So there was a there was a stimulus here. Let's use a black or blue. So stimulus here. This next section is going to be stimulus plus you know the positive charge from the first one. And then this next one will be stimulus plus the positive charge of the second one. So it gets easier to move this action potential down the membrane as we go from one section to another because of this difference in between positive and negative charges. So then this guy depolarizes. So here's our depolarization. And this section is done repolarization because we see that we have the negative uh, uh, charge inside. So now we've got sodium inside and we've got potassium outside so we we've gone back to our normal resting potential and once again these guys here this positive charge will affect this and this positive charge will affect this so we can continue this direction but we can't continue this direction it doesn't work that way so this positive charge can't affect this negative charge 
because we are in our refractory period. So opening the sodium channels here doesn't cause sodium to rush in because the sodium's already inside of the cell. Okay, opening the potassium channels here doesn't cause potassium to leave the cell because potassium's already left the cell. So as we continue to do this, so this section affects this section, this section affects this section, and going in the opposite direction, it doesn't do anything because of the refractory period. So this causes the impulse to move in a single direction down the axon. So we're always moving and affecting the next section of membrane. Uh, we're never really affecting the section of membrane earlier in the axon because of the refractory period. Now, once again, maybe this is a little hard for you guys. So, again, watch a video. It's going to explain how transmission is ha happening in a single direction. You need to write down in your notes uh, how this process happens. You should just kind of sequence or briefly explain uh, why transmission is occurring in a single direction as we move down an axon. An action potential, depicted as a red band, is propagated in one direction along the axon. During an action potential, the inside of the cell membrane becomes positive with respect to the outside. An action potential generates local currents that tend to depolarize the membrane immediately adjacent to the action potential. When depolarization caused by the local currents reaches threshold, a new action potential is produced adjacent to the original one. Action potential propagation occurs in one direction because the recently depolarized area of the membrane is in absolute refractory period and cannot generate an action potential. So, we've depolarized the section of our membrane and now we can go through the repolarization process. So after the impulse is passed on to the next section of the axon membrane, uh, the potassium channel is open, potassium is going to rush out, we are repolarizing, we're going back to being a negative charge, maybe plus 40 down to negative 65, and this repolarization uh, always happens in an area, uh, but this, obviously the nerve is going to need to send more signals, it's not that a nerve sends one signal and then it's done, so then we have to go through our refractory period. Now, because of this refractory period, um, we're sending stuff in one consistent direction uh, and we're basically moving step by step down the uh, down the membrane. So let me uh, let me draw. So here's a nerve cell with myelin sheaths on it. And then here's one that does not have any myelin sheaths on it. So then if we do depolarization here and we help depolarize the next section and we help depolarize the next section. And then that helps depolarize the next section. And again, 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 and again. Uh, we're moving down the axon at a pretty good speed, but it's actually, uh, we could do it faster. And that's where the myelin sheath comes in. And the myelin sheath basically uh, are these insulated pockets these little Schwann cells, which are wrapped around our, our axon. And basically, they're there uh, as insulators, very much the way the idea that we have insulation around wiring in, in a, an electricity, in some type of electronic device. Now, yes, uh, putting rubber around a wire does make it safer. Uh, and so the myelin sheaths do actually protect the, ex the axons. They help the axons... Uh, be a little bit more stable because they're protected but by putting rubber around uh, a wire where electrons are going to th flow through it there the efficiency or the movement of the electrons is faster because uh, the the electrons are less likely to bleed or to leave the wire and, and just enter and, and bump into uh, atoms of, of elements and compounds in the air around the wire so we're keeping all the electrons inside that piece of metal and we're not going to lose them to anything. The myelin sheath on the axon uh, happens very much the same way. So here we have, a, here's a depolarization, right? So we've had an action potential 
we've depolarized and we have our positives on the inside and we have our, our negatives on the outside, right? So as you just saw, uh, these could affect right here. They could affect the next section of a membrane and we could just continue that all the way down the axon and that would be pretty good. But by having this myelin sheath here, uh, these effect, the effect of the positive charge can be stretched a little further down the membrane till the next um, node of uh, Ranvier. But remember, the space between them are nodes of Ranvier, right? So then we cause an action potential here. So here's our depolarization right here. And again, this positive charge, by insulating it, we could stretch the effect. And then, bam, we have another depolarization much further down the axon. So by doing this, by covering the axon with these myelin, neath, uh, these myelin sheaths, uh, we're basically allowing the impulse to jump great distances down the axon. So rather than moving one section of membrane at a time, it's, it's jumping down multiple sections of membranes from one node of Ranvier to the next node of Ranvier. And it's just doing this over and over again. And actually it ends up being much faster than if we were just using an axon by itself. So in areas where we need very, very fast transmission, so sections of the brain where we need fast movement, and the sections of the spinal cord where we need fast, fast movement, and your sensory neurons and your motor neurons, which are supposed to have fast movement of information, we see lots of myelin sheaths covering the axon. So by having this property, we can increase the speed. And I want to talk a little bit exactly, exactly how much speed are we talking about here. So uh, of course, as I just said, that stimulating every single section of the axon is not the fastest way to transmit one of these uh, impulses down the axon. An action potential, and then a little bit further, and another action potential, and then a little bit further, another action potential. I mean, it is fairly fast, but it's not the fastest way to do it. So by using the myelin sheaths, uh, we could increase the speed. Now there's different ways we could increase the speed. If we wanted to, uh, we could also increase the diameter of the axon, which would really increase the speed as well. Uh, but this would result in a limitation of size. So for example, if we increase the diameter of the axon, uh, we could get up to 25 meters per second. But then the largest, our largest axon in our entire body has a diameter of 1.7 millimeters. So if we wanted to have uh, a really, really large axon and to have a really large speed, uh, that wouldn't be very useful because then we wouldn't be able to fit these nerves inside of our, our small bodies. Our bodies wouldn't be able to contain our expanding nervous system. So rather than increasing the diameters of the axons, uh, complex organisms evolved to have the myelin sheath, which increases the efficiency of an axon and keeping them small. So this efficiency is through the process of called uh, saltatory conduction. So saltatory conduction is basically this propagation, and that's a really good word for you guys to remember. This propagation uh, of this axon down the, uh, the so the propagation of the action potential down the axon through the myelinated sheets. So once again, here's our action potential, depolarization. And the positive charge, positive charge, positive charge, it moves down the axon just a little bit. And then, bam, another depolarization. And then uh, positive charge, positive charge, positive charge, moving down through the, uh, through the inside of the cell. And then, bam, another depolarization. And this allows us to jump, okay, jump down the axon rather than move uh, in a walking pace. We're leaping down the axon. So we're basically jumping down the axon instead of walking down the axon. So basically ions uh, are only going to flow uh, or cannot pass through the membranes uh, where they're covered by the myelinated seats. So sodium can't leave here, okay, it can't do that. So since sodium can't leave, it's only going to move through the inside until it gets to the next node of Ranvier, and then it will be able to uh, diffuse out uh, at the next road of Ranvier. So this allows a quick diffusion of sodium ions from a high concentration 
to a low concentration. So once again, we're seeing movement uh, and diffusion being a big part of this process. Now, we can create a three uh, millimeter axon diameter that can fire at 130 meters per second. That's really, really fast, right? And if it was unmyelinated and we wanted to do it 330 meters per second, we would have to have a 300 millimeter diameter axon. Now that's, that's pretty ridiculous, right? So we need to have very, very small axons. We have axons uh, of nearly three millimeters in size instead of axons at a 300 millimeters in size. So we have a really, really high efficiency uh, by keeping our diameter small and our, our, uh, our transmission rate very efficient because of the myelin sheets. Okay, look, another video. Yay! Again, if you're having a little problems with this, there's a great video on saltatory conduction. It will explain how myelinated sheaths are allowing faster transmission. And in your notes, I want you to make sure you are diagramming this idea. I want to see nice, clear pictures drawing out how this process actually happens so that you, uh, you really understand uh, the process on a visual way. What you will see and hear in this presentation is the development of myelin in the peripheral nervous system and the propagation of the action potential along a myelinated axon. This multimedia presentation will be most helpful if you already have a good understanding of the Schwann cell and the electrochemical process of the neuron, called the action potential. The Schwann cell forms a protective covering around the axon. Schwann cells start to develop in the embryo and continue to increase the wrapping around the axon through childhood. This development increases the thickness of the wrappings which peaks in adolescence. This is why teenagers have such quick responses. The Schwann cell contains the typical cell organelles and cell membrane structure. However, notice as the Schwann cell surrounds the axon that the nucleus and other organelles are squeezed to the outside wrapping of the cell. This outer wrapping of the Schwann cell is called the neurolemma. The inner lining is made up of layers upon layers of cell membrane. This inner wrapping is called the myelin sheath. You will recall that the cell membrane, called the fluid mosaic model, is made up of a bilayer of lipids integrated with proteins. The thicker the myelin, in other words, the more layers of cell membrane making up the myelin, the more advantageous it is to the axon. One advantage is the regeneration of severed axons. Another advantage is an increase in the speed of the propagation of the action potential along the axon. The rest of this presentation will concentrate on the increased speed of action potentials down the length of the myelinated axon. Here is the neuron, and you can see the repeated Schwann cell membrane forming the myelin. Note that there is a small space between the Schwann cells where the axon is not covered by the neuroglial cell. These spaces are called nodes of Rambier. From what you already know, action potentials occur at the axon hillock and continue to be repeated away from the cell body, much like dominoes falling one after another. An action potential starts on a polarized membrane, which is negative 70. A stimulus causes the sodium gates to open slightly and sodium starts to trickle into the cell. If the cell reaches negative 60 or threshold, the sodium gates open wide and sodium floods in, bringing the inside of the axon to positive 30. At this point, the sodium gates close and potassium gates open. Potassium starts to pour out of the cell. This allows the neuron to become polarized again. Then the sodium-potassium pump starts to actively transport sodium out and potassium back into the neuron. First, we will look at the propagation of the action potential in the unmyelinated axon. Propagation is the repeating of action potentials down the axon. The action potential is repeated because as the sodium comes in, it diffuses to adjacent areas within the axon. As the sodium increases in this area, threshold is reached. Sodium gates open wide, sodium rushes in, causing depolarization and an action potential. As the sodium enters this area, it diffuses through the axoplasm and another action potential is created. This continues down the length of the axon. 
Now look at the myelinated axon. The same process applies to the myelinated axon. An action potential develops, and as the sodium comes in, it diffuses through the cytoplasm of the axon. It continues to diffuse through the portion of the axon wrapped in myelin. The increased sodium concentration reaches the node of Ranvier, increases the axoplasm to negative 60, and depolarization occurs. The sodium gates open wide, sodium floods in, and we have an action potential. Again, the sodiums diffuse through the axoplasm, reaching the next node. An action potential develops. The process is continued down the myelinated axon, passing from node to node. Compare the unmyelinated axon with the myelinated axon. You can see that action potential reached the end of the myelinated axon more rapidly than the unmyelinated axon. The speed of the propagation is faster going from node to node than action potentials that develop adjacent to the previous action potential. So, I hope you enjoyed this probably fairly confusing and complicated mixy. Don't worry, we're going to go really slowly through all of this again tomorrow. We're going to sequence all of the steps. Do your best to understand this material. Get ready for your, your quiz that you'll have. Uh, this is your practice problems. We'll try to look at these in class tomorrow, 2A and 2B. So, uh, good luck, and uh, we'll talk about this tomorrow in class. Thanks for stopping by.